Hello, friends. James Stevenson here, along with Loki the Chihuahua, for a special Tesla Earnings Day edition of uh, What's James Doing on His Computer Today? So Loki and I will walk you through a series of tweets, a little thread that I just posted uh, to Twitter talking about Tesla earnings and specifically helping you to understand the breakdown of a few different kinds of EPS numbers. And it gets confusing. So there's gap EPS, there's non-gap EPS, and there's gonna be adjusted non-gap EPS. Pardon the sound of my coffee brewing. That'll be ready for me when the video's over. So uh, I will explain those concepts to you, what makes them different, and share with you a visualization that I worked on yesterday and today that tries to help make clearer uh, what's going on with those. So the first thing I'll do is share my desktop with you. And next I will bring up my Twitter. So here's Twitter and here is this thread that I just tweeted out a few minutes ago, less than an hour ago anyhow. And I'll make this visualization big and walk you through what we're looking at here. So these are not total dollars, which is what you're gonna see on the income statement. Normally, the only number that gets divided by the total number of shares, fully diluted shares of the company is the earnings number. The bottom line profit is something that's good to put on a per share basis. Sometimes you'll see people talk about revenue per share. Uh, so that number comes up sometimes. The rest of these numbers are hardly ever viewed this way, but it's totally legit math. You can take any total number on the income statement or the balance sheet and divide it by the share count and get a, a real number uh, that's useful for purposes like this one. So what I did was I just took all of the income statement items and I tried to bucket those into uh, big enough groups that there wouldn't be really tiny numbers on here, like one cent or two cents, right? So what we see on the left here is revenues per diluted share. And all of these are for the Q2 2022 time period. Now, the actuals aren't going to be reported until this afternoon. Uh, this is still my forecast for what these numbers are going to be right now because that's the best numbers I have for right now. And probably come back tomorrow and do a comparison and see how far off this was versus what Tesla actually reports. So uh, what we have here are all of the different kinds of revenue that Tesla makes. So Tesla has, uh, I would say, three major divisions of revenue. So automotive revenue is all the money Tesla makes selling cars and leasing cars to people. So those do get their own lines on the income statement, but I group them together here because leasing is pretty small. Then there's the energy divisions revenue. So, right, Loki? Yes. So this is talking about energy generation and storage. So we're talking about solar panels, we're talking about uh, power walls, power packs, those sorts of things. Then everything else gets bucketed into the everything else category, which uh, Tesla calls services and other. So in the income statement, you'll see a line for services and other revenue, uh, where all the sales are reported. And you'll see services and other cost of sales on the income statement. Those are all the direct costs related to uh, selling people the stuff that falls into that category. So this is over-the-air updates and Tesla insurance and used car sales and the Tesla store and anything else that hasn't been counted already as either automotive revenue or energy revenue, it falls in here. Okay, so this is how those break down. And I wanted to stack these two at the bottom here because the next column over is the expenses. Okay, well, how do you break down the expenses? Well, these three have the direct costs related to them as cost of sales. That's what the COS is over here. 
this is the cost of delivering to people whatever it is that they bought, whatever the product or service is, what was the direct cost of getting them what they took uh, for their side of that transaction when they forked over their money to Tesla. And you can see I'm forecasting the all other, the services and other line to not make any profit at all because their cost of sales will be the same as the revenue. And for the energy division, I'm forecasting them to lose a little bit of money, which happens a lot in the energy division, right? Uh, so if these were the only two divisions of Tesla, Tesla would lose money <laughs> for sure, because we haven't gotten to all these other expenses yet, right? So it, it sure is a good thing that Tesla has a profitable automotive uh, division. So you can see here, that's where all the opportunity for profit is coming from. Uh, I'm forecasting $12.55 of automotive revenue per diluted share and only $8.87 worth of cost of sales uh, in the automotive division per diluted share. And other people have a lower number than this uh, because I'm forecasting a higher uh, automotive cost of sales uh, after or net of regulatory credits than most people are. Uh, in in this forecast, so I'm I'm a little pessimistic due to all the uh, supply chain challenges, cost pressures, and Shanghai being such a small percentage of the mix this quarter, due to the Shanghai lockdowns that shut that uh, factory for a few weeks and then kept it running at really limited capacity for another few weeks. So I think the sum of those things plus Giga Berlin and Austin trying to ramp up at the same time is going to cause uh, cost of sales to dip sequentially by a few points. Uh, but other people aren't as pessimistic about that. So maybe I'll be wrong and Tesla will do uh, uh, a much better cost of sales number. Okay, so what else is on here? Well, the next one up from automotive cost of sales is R&D, the really light blue here is 55 cents per share of research and development expenses. Um, so this is the Franz von Holzhausen organization and all the battery research and development stuff. And uh, some of the production costs uh, that happen at factories before they start producing vehicles they can sell can get counted as research and development expense. Then uh, SG&A, selling general and administrative costs. Think of these as like headquarters costs, all the staff that you have to pay to work at your headquarters and all the, you know, marketing and finance and uh, administrative type costs that you have to have to run a big corporation. Then there's taxes and other expense uh, in the little darker blue uh, here. So this is the everything else bucket. I tried to throw a bunch of stuff in here. Um, uh, so, sorry, that's the 15 cent bucket. The SGNA was 75 cents. I've confused myself with my uh, blues being too close to each other. Then there's the restructuring and other costs. Most quarters, that's zero dollars, but this quarter, there's going to be at least two major components in this number that I'm forecasting. One is a Bitcoin impairment, and the other one is the restructuring expenses associated with layoffs that Tesla did during Q2. Those were almost entirely to salaried. Uh, so about 3% of Tesla's workforce was laid off in salary positions. Uh, Tesla is continuing to hire throughout this year and will end the year with more employees than they started the year with for sure. Uh, but they did uh, some layoffs in Q2. So those costs will be part of this 46 cents. I think almost all of this is gonna be Bitcoin uh, maybe about 40 cents of it'll be uh, the Bitcoin impairment and the other six cents will be the restructuring and layoffs. We'll find out what the numbers are this afternoon. Uh, what's a Bitcoin impairment? It just means that under the gap accounting rules, if Bitcoin trades lower during a quarter than it has ever traded since you've owned that Bitcoin, you have to figure out how much lower and then multiply that by the number of Bitcoin that you own, and then take that as a write down of asset value that flows through your income statement as though it's an expense. It's a non-cash item. There's no real 
transaction happening here. Tesla still owns as many Bitcoin as they did before, but the accounting rules say you have to go with the most conservative possible valuation of how much that Bitcoin is worth. And so that's why you have to write uh, uh, to record an impairment whenever the price of Bitcoin goes lower than it's been since you owned your Bitcoin. It never goes the other way. You never get to write the value of that asset back up again unless you sell it. At the point that you sell it, you can take that gain uh, through your income statement. Next is stock-based compensation. So uh, when Tesla reports on the income statement, this 28 cents is scattered amongst the areas where people are earning the stock-based compensation, be that you know automotive, research and development, SG&A, all those areas. Uh, can earn stock-based compensation because every Tesla employee is eligible to, uh, once they meet the eligibility requirements, to participate in a stock-based compensation plan uh, to have part of their compensation come as stock. So that's 28 cents. This is another non-cash item, and the accountants and the gap uh, uh, accounting authorities say when you report your earnings as a publicly traded company, you have to count that expense as though it had been uh, cash compensation to employees to put you on equal footing against other companies that pay their employees in cash instead of in stock. That way it's a fair comparison. That's what that's about. Uh, but Wall Street says, no, that's, that's a non-cash expense we're gonna throw out that stock-based compensation because it's it didn't really happen. The company didn't have to cough up 28 cents per share of cash to pay this expense. They just issued more shares of stock in the company uh, to those employees. And that leaves us with the gap EPS as Tesla will report it. I'm forecasting that number to be $1.45 uh, in Q2 of 2022. So that's what we see here. And I kind of just touched on what this non-GAAP EPS is. If you take the $1.45 and you add back the 28 cents of non-cash stock-based compensation, this is always going to be the non-GAAP number. So it's going to be uh, whatever the stock-based compensation was. Pretend that didn't happen and put it back into the earnings. So it would be $1.73 in this case. And then what we're, what we're likely to see happen this afternoon is for the adjusted non-GAAP EPS uh, that you'll see mentioned in, in Wall Street analysts' notes about their thoughts on Tesla's earnings. They'll adjust in some or all of this 46 cents uh, that I'm forecasting for restructuring another. So instead of it being, you know, if these are the numbers, let's say I got it exactly right, uh, then you might see something like a 219 listed as adjusted non-GAAP EPS, excluding both stock-based compensation and the restructuring and other, which is mostly the Bitcoin impairment. Now, they may slice off the piece of that that's the restructuring, like truly the layoffs cost, and say, no, that counts. We're going to leave that part in, but we'll throw out the Bitcoin part of it as being just some bogus uh, accounting rule that everybody has to uh, play by. All right, what else is on this chart that I haven't talked about? Well, let me go back to the thread and see if I've missed any points that I made there. So uh, there's this longstanding battle <laughs> over whether stock-based compensation expense should count against earnings or not. Accountants say it should, they determine the gap rules, so that's how companies have to report their earnings, gap, EPS. Uh, but Wall Street says it's non-cash and they throw it out. I just talked about that. Uh, also, thanks to gap accounting rules, Tesla has to report a non-cash Bitcoin impairment because the price of Bitcoin dipped lower in Q2 than where it's traded since Tesla bought it. Uh, Wall Street analysts ignore that baloney so hard, it's not even in most of their estimates. Now, why am I mentioning that? Because it's really important, and I'll get to that in a second. So their adjusted non-GAAP EPS will exclude both stock-based compensation and that Bitcoin impairment item. So if Tesla reports earnings just below the Wall Street consensus this afternoon, expect to see mass confusion over whether that counts as a beat or not, uh, since most analyst estimates 
never included the Bitcoin impairment to begin with. So they didn't even bother guessing how much the Bitcoin impairment was going to be to put it into their earnings estimate um, because they knew they were just going to throw it out anyway. So in most cases, the EPS estimates being used to compile the consensus didn't have the Bitcoin impairment in there anyway. So they're artificially higher than what Tesla is going to be reporting by the weighted average amount of Bitcoin expense. They didn't bother putting in their estimate at all. Um, so there's still a lot of uh, variables. We don't have the report yet. Uh, I better hurry up and get this YouTube video posted before uh, earnings get published this afternoon. But I'd argue any non-GAAP EPS number within 40 cents or so of the Wall Street consensus non-GAAP EPS estimate, uh, Gary Black says it's $1.77, uh, would count as a beat. So any number that Tesla reports as non-GAAP uh, EPS, so after backing out the stock-based compensation, so you take the, the GAAP number, you figure out how much the stock-based compensation is, uh, you back that out to get to the non-GAAP number, which should also be in the release. Uh, just make sure you're looking at the right number. Any non-GAAP EPS number better than $1.37 this afternoon would count as a beat. And most people are uh, estimating better than $1.37 of non-GAAP EPS if they're including the Bitcoin impairment in there. So, that brings me to the end of this video. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, why not click the like button? Uh, and if you're not subscribed to my channel, I suggest that you go ahead and subscribe to my channel. And I will see you in the next one.